Hello everyone and welcome to lesson 4.1a, which is our very first lesson in our unit on independence movements. So today's lesson will actually focus on the origins and rise of independence movements and specifically focusing on Zimbabwe. So by the end of today's lesson, you should be able to understand how political ideology and colonization impacted the independence movement of Zimbabwe. Second, describe the impact of one of race relations and economic factors in the independence of Zimbabwe. And thirdly, explain the origins of black nationalist organizations. For example, the ICU and S-Rank, which is the Southern Rhodesian African National Congress. Before we even begin our study on Zimbabwe, here in the United States, many people say that Africa is a country, it is a continent, so a country is incorrect. And sadly, many people in the West cannot even locate most countries in Africa. So that is what we're going to start with. In order for us to learn about Zimbabwe, we need to know where it's located. So Zimbabwe is located right here. It is the orange country right there that I just circled in Southern Africa. If you will notice, it is bordered by Zambia, Mozambique, South Africa, Botswana, and believe it or not, it does have a very, 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 very small border with Namibia. But nonetheless, here is the nation of Zimbabwe, and that is the nation that we will be talking about as our case study for independence movements. So a couple of things before we actually physically start the lesson. Um, just a reminder, here is the location of your lesson uh, number is 4.1a. This is the title of this particular slide, which is Role of Political Ideology. And a reminder to all of you that anytime you see something in blue, this is something that you definitely want to write notes about because it is very important um, and it is a key component for success uh, in analyzing uh, Zimbabwe's independence movement. So definitely make sure that you are concentrating on these blue terms throughout the lesson. So now, the nation of Zimbabwe that we know today is actually named after a, an ancient uh, stone ruin of the great Zimbabwe people. So Zimbabwean people is actually a culture group within um, ancient times in Southern Africa. So there were Zimbabwean individuals. And it dominated culture and learning in this region for more than 500 years. So before the arrival of white people from Europe in this particular region, the great Zimbabwe empire, and it was an empire, dominated this region and uh, had trading patterns, uh, a fully functioning culture and society before the emergence of white domination in this region. With the discovery of gold, as with all things, sadly, in many parts of uh, world history, with the discovery of gold in this region, here comes Great Britain. And of course, we don't, that goes without saying, and the fact that here comes Great Britain, and we've already established in many other aspects of history that oftentimes this comes trouble, <laughs> and sadly, this will be the case. Now, Great Britain itself did not colonize the area known as Zimbabwe. It granted a charter and it gave this charter to a gentleman named Cecil Rhodes. And Cecil Rhodes uh, created this group called the British South Africa Company, which is BSAC. And this particular company was given a charter to exploit the resources of that region. And as a result, this charter, it basically created a company, which was BSAC. And that company is designed to run and manage this area. So eventually, the whole area of Zimbabwe became known as Rhodesia, and it's named after Cecil Rhodes. Um, so the nation of Zimbabwe used to be called Rhodesia, named after a white man from England. So let that settle on you for just a moment. So again, with the massive arrival of more and more white settlers um, into the region as a result of the discovery of gold and other resources, White settlers move in larger numbers in the 1890s. So you're going to see massive immigration of white people to uh, this region as a result of gold. In 1896 and 97, so over about a year period, uh, the BSAC uh, actually had its own militia. So it is a company that has its own militia. And it actually crushed several rebellions by the Shona and Indibele people of Zimbabwe. These two groups, you do need to know, the Shona and the Indibele, those are the two dominant uh culture groups within um, within Zimbabwe. So these are um, black uh, culture groups, and those are the most dominant in Zimbabwe. So these two groups are brutally crushed by the white uh, uh, military that is being run by BSAC. Now, 
In addition to these crushing of these rebellions to gain further control over natives, which are black people at this time, um, BSAC administration is going to use the following tactics. They're going to use land seizures, meaning they just literally will go into an Indibele uh, tribal group or a Shona group and just literally seize the land without any payment or any regulation whatsoever. They would tax these people off of their land or they would round them up and put into forced labor. Yes, in the 1890s, rounding people up and putting them into forced labor, labor, that is still a form of slavery. I mean, yes, in the 1890s, even though slavery was outlawed in Great Britain, you have to remember, BSAC is not Britain, it's its own company. So, not trying to put light on it, but by all intents and purposes, that forced labor was a form of slavery, even though it was illegal. And by 1914, 25,000 white settlers had subdued the natives in this region. With the continued arrival of all of these white settlers and, and whatnot into Zimbabwe, which at this time is called Rhodesia, the white settlers there didn't want to keep BSAC running the area. The reason being is because BSAC, remember, it's a company. And so the ad administration of BSAC, they're con they control the economy and they line their pockets of the investors. So literally, the BSAC individuals were going into Zimbabwe and taking everything and taking all the money for themselves. So the white settlers that were living there literally were not getting anything. So they don't want to continue BSAC control. So in 1922, a referendum was held by the local white settlers and they rejected a proposal that was given to merge Zimbabwe with South Africa to make it into one larger, company, one larger country. So the white people in Zimbabwe or Rhodesia said no. The very next year, 1923, BSAC's charter expired. So BSAC did not get its charter renewed, <clears throat> so as a result, the territory became known as Southern Rhodesia. The reason being is because Northern Rhodesia, which is now the nation of Zambia, Rhodesia was larger. It was both Zimbabwe and Zambia, and technically Nyasaland, which is today Malawi, all merged together, and that became known as Rhodesia. And so Southern Rhodesia was Zimbabwe, and Northern Rhodesia was Zim Zambia. Throughout all of this, this is the key thing to note. White settlers have established a political ideology and a political system within Zimbabwe, a.k.a. Rhodesia, based totally on colon colonialism and colonization. So, let's shift our focus now to role of race and economic factors. Now, in 1923, when uh, Rhodesia became, uh, or Southern Rhodesia became its own colony, it was totally controlled by, by the local white population. Please understand this. The British government does not have control over this colony. So this is a map here of what is today Zimbabwe, which back then was known as Southern Rhodesia. Great Britain does not control this colony. The local white population controls this colony. The only thing Britain does is it has a supervisory role over this region. So a lot. So even though Britain was more forceful in other colonies uh, protecting the rights of the local indigenous people, um, like in Kenya, for example, Britain did try to fight more, more heavily for that. But here in uh, Rhodesia, they didn't do so. In fact, the white population created a new pot constitution, and that constitution did not specifically forbid black people from voting, but the qualifications for voting for black people were so high that most native people simply could not vote because they couldn't meet the requirements. In 1953, only 560 black people in the entire nation of Zimbabwe could actually vote. So, one of the ways that they're going to go about suppressing black people is the passage of this piece of legislation, the Land Apportionment Act of 1930. And what this does is that it gives white people, which is a very small part of the population, control over half of the land. So this is a huge thing. You take half of the land of Zimbabwe and give it to white people, which are very small in number, and give the other half to the black population, which is a population in the millions. Africans were pushed, pushed to what is called reserves. They were, these were often the most arid and useless land, so the, uh, not useless, but the, uh, the worst land, if you will, available. All black people needed a pass to leave reservations or to seek work. So if you were a black person living on these black areas are the, are the areas reserved for black people. If you left those areas, you needed to have a pass. And just a quick note on the reserves that they had, um, they're overcrowded, they're overgrazed, and they're overstocked. So again, these were arid places, and they were very dry, and they really did not produce anything, and they were overcrowded and overgrazed. So these particular areas are destitute, to say the least. So let's fast forward to the Great Depression in this area, and sadly, all black farmers uh, 
farmed intensively, causing ecolo ecological damage and famine. Um, and of course, the United States did this as well. We saw farmers that just over farmed and whatnot um, during our Great Depression as well. So this is something that many farmers tried to do and black farmers struggled with that because they were already on the poorest land in the area anyway to begin with. So the Great Depression just made life worse for black people. Now, here in northern Rhodesia, copper was actually discovered um, around this time. And so lots and lots of white settlers in southern Rhodesia are crossing the border into northern Rhodesia, which is today Zambia, um, in order to kind of gain more uh, wealth and p uh, power through the discovery of copper. Um, eventually, there was a railroad that is going to unite both northern and southern Rhodesia. And so as an, as an idea, this, this whole thought of this idea of the greater Rhodesia starts to gain traction. And what this point was, was that people were trying to decide about how to unite all three of these territories, which were British uh, colonies, and that's northern and southern Rhodesia and Nyasaland, which is today Malawi, if you want to know what that is, Malawi. Um, and so Greater Rhodesia was the idea of uniting all three of those together into one nation. Well, the British actually sent uh, a group of people down to uh, investigate that and created something called the Bledisloe Report. And the Bledisloe Report was done in 1939. And one of the things that it did conclude was that all three of these territories were economically uh, connected and that it would be very beneficial. So it would be beneficial for, all, for both the, all three of them to merge. However, they also noted that native fears of spread of racism from southern Rhodesia into the other two category, or other two areas was really, really prominent. The key thing about the Bledisloe Report is that this was the first time that black voices were heard in London. And the British government was in direct support of black voices. They really wanted blacks, uh, black people to be able to have local control and the local white population did not. So both Britain and the white population are at political odds with each other. Unfortunately, there was no further discussion about the Bledisloe Report because World War II started in 1939 and all discussion ended. Well, at the conclusion of World War II, the economy in Zimbabwe is blossoming, it is booming. So there is a huge economic boom in uh, what is Rhodesia or Zimbabwe after World War II. And as a result, the growth of white farming and manufacturing put tremendous increases on the demand for labor because, you know, white workers, or not white workers, but white people that are owning all the industry in Rhodesia, aka Zimbabwe, they need workers. So this is increasing the demand for African labor, which is cheaper labor. A lot of this sounds very similar from what we've discussed in previous subjects about, you know, cheap labor and basically indentured servitude. So how does Zimbabwe or Rhodesia respond? They passed the Land Husbandry Act of 1951. And what this did was that it divided the land in the reserves for smaller farms. So if you remember the previous slides, there was a map there. They had these little black boxes, and those were areas that were, de that were uh, designated for black farmers. This, land, this act further divided that. And what that did was that it was designed to force black workers to move to cities for cheap labor. Because if you divide the land and there's, let's say there's 300 farmers and then you divide the land and into smaller farms and there's only, you know, 150, that means that 150 other souls have to go find work. So that was what they were trying to do, force the black people off the reserves that they forced them onto a couple of years before so that they could work in the city. This creates social problems, increasing of poverty and poor living conditions for these natives that are moving to the city. And this is an early basis of African nationalism because as black people started recognizing that they were being exploited even more so than they had been in the past, this causes more and more African people to start discussing the idea of overthrowing the white regime that has been established in Rhodesia and in Zimbabwe. With the, with the economic success that's going on uh, after World War II, there was a revival of the thought of uniting all three of the, of the colonies together into one entity, and that actually did happen. In 1953, they merged uh, northern and southern Rhodesia and Nyasaland into one country called the Central African Federation in 1953. And this was both, like I said, northern and southern Rhodesia plus Nyasaland, which is Malawi. Now, the white settlers in this region um, put tremendous pressure on Britain to allow this to happen, which they did. and. The British did this with the thought that this would return to uh, majority rule. That's what they were hoping was that the uniting of these territories would, you know, 
increase tremendously the black population that was already there and then increase their voting power and the ability to eventually turn this region over to majority rule. However, that is not what happened here, unfortunately. Um, the union of all of these territories, which at this point uh, also includes right there, which is Botswana, um, was definitely opposed by the native people because there was fear of racial policy spreading from southern Rhodesia. So if you remember, um, southern Rhodesia had, which is right here, which is Zimbabwe, it had the, the white majority running everything and it has these racist policies. Well, northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland are fearful that those racist policies will spread to the other two territories. So this union was opposed by the black people. Now, the CAF, or Central African Federation Parliament, had 35 total members. Six of them were black. And they were allowed to have two from each territory. So two black people from Nyasaland, two from northern Rhodesia, two from southern Rhodesia. The native people in northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland were able to choose their own uh, officials to represent them in parliament. In southern Rhodesia, unfortunately, the black people were not allowed to choose them. The white people chose the black representatives on behalf of the black population. So Britain, again, I, like I said, hoped that this would lead to majority rule or African rule, but that was nope. Southern Rhodesia flat out refused, so the idea of majority rule in the Central African Federation never manifests and never is going to happen. So with all of this oppression on the black population, this is going to lead to the rise of black nationalist organizations, and let's talk about a couple. So the first one here is the ICU, or the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union. And one of the things that they did uh, to try to draw attention to the plight of, of African workers was mass meetings calling for better working conditions. Because remember, you know, the, the white people had already forced the black people on reserves and then further divided their land, forcing more black people off the reserves to go back to the cities to live in poverty. And so the ICU was actually protesting that by, with meetings and calling for better working conditions. But keep in mind, this was all regional. And so since it's regional, there's not anything really national. The first real attempt at a national movement is the creation of S-Rank, which is the Southern Rhodesian African National Congress. And like I said, that's the first attempt at making a national movement. So a lot, this right here, this photograph is the first picture of the first uh, leadership members of, of the S-Rank group. And so these gentlemen here are the ones who are gonna fight for the, uh, the rights of black individuals to live in peace and harmony in the area that we call Zimbabwe today. Now, there were factors that were preventing black people from actually being able to effectively organize, and those are most of them lived on reserves, and they're out in the middle of nowhere, and so they really can't get into the cities to make any difference. They have a lack of education because they weren't really allowed to be in school because the white regime prevented it. And segregation and repression by the white people in Rhodesia, or excuse me, southern Rhodesia, prevented black people from really being able to effectively organize. So, our lesson has concluded for the origins and rise of independence movements part A. We're going to continue it in the second half, but that was way too much to add. So, take a moment to, to discuss, to think about the first half of the origins and rise of the independence movement of Zimbabwe. Can you answer these questions? Do you understand how political ideology and colonization impacted the independence movement of Zimbabwe? Can you describe the impact of race relations and economic factors in independence of Zimbabwe? And can you explain the origins of the black uh, nationalist organizations like the ICU and S-Rank? If you can, pat yourself on the back. You did an amazing job. At this point, complete any activity for less than 4.1a and then proceed on to 4.1b. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day.